Having covered the uh, united monarchy, we're now going to turn our attention to the divided monarchy. And so where we ended with uh, Solomon, uh, at the end of Solomon's reign, I mentioned that the kingdom split. And this is presented as, uh, or sort of the theological evaluation is this, that, that it uh, is the result of Solomon's sins. Solomon's worship of other gods, his building of the high places um, as worship sites for his wives, um, and uh, and it divi the fact that he violates most of the uh, requirements for kings in the book of Deuteronomy. And that's very important to keep in mind because, again, we are in the Deuteronomistic history, and they are evaluating kings based on the uh, standards of Deuteronomy. And if that's the criterion, then Solomon was an absolutely terrible king. Now, there are positive things about Solomon, but that may be pre-Deuteronomic. That may be um, other traditions that were drawn on and used. Not everything in the Deuteronomistic history is necessarily the work of Deuteronomists, people writing from that perspective. Um, they are incorporating traditional material in there. So, pro, pro just maybe, you know, uh, court apologies for the Davidic monarchy. But then they're overlaying it with this Deuteronomic theology, uh, this Deuteronomic uh, interpretation. And in that sense, Solomon is actually a pretty terrible king. And in fact, the things that Solomon does set the nation on the path to exile. Many of the practices and the institutions that ultimately lead to the exile begin with Solomon. Uh, the high places, in particular, Solomon builds the high places. These are a major part of uh, the, the sin and the practices that lead to the exile. One of the main ways Solomon's successors will be evaluated is, did they build up the high places or did they tear them down? Now, as the immediate result of Solomon's sin uh, is the split of the kingdom. And this, uh, this, begin, uh, this happens in the year 922 B.C., um, we've got, uh, Rehoboam is the, uh, the successor of Solomon. That's Solomon's son. He becomes king when Solomon dies. Um, there was also a, a guy named Jeroboam, son of Nebat. Now, Jeroboam was, uh, an official in, De in, uh, Solomon's government, but he had, uh, rebelled against Solomon, it sort of plotted against him, and he had to flee the country. When Solomon dies, he comes back. In fact, God summons him back. God speaks to Jeroboam and says, I am about to tear the kingdom from the hand of Solomon, and I will give you ten tribes. So these are the northern tribes. One tribe will remain his for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem. So again, this is the Davidic covenant. Solomon has to retain something. Um, but Jeroboam will get the rest of them. So Rehoboam, that's Solomon's son, becomes king. He doesn't reign over all of the tribes for very long because um, as he is sort of preparing to take office, he is summoning counsel from various people. Um, first, he considers the older advisors, the people who had served under his father, and he asked them, what should I do? What should I say to make the people loyal to me? And they say, well, tell them that you will ease the burden that their father had put on them. Think back to the way of king's speech in 1 Samuel, uh, 1 Samuel 8. About all the burdens, all the taxes and the conscription and everything that, that Solomon did. Uh, he says, if you lighten that, uh, if you decrease taxes, the people will love you and they will serve you forever. But then he also considers younger advisors, and they say the opposite. They say, tell them that, uh, that uh, my father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with, scor with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. So talk tough. Show them who's boss. Well, Rehoboam listens to the younger advisors, and the result is the people say, what share do we have with David? 
We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. Look now to your own house, O David. So in essence, they say, we're going to take our ball and go home. We don't need you. You're not one of us. Remember, unlike, the, uh, unlike Saul, the Davidic uh, dynasty is not centrally located. They are from the south. They are Judahites. And the ties between Israel and Judah were always very tenuous. Remember, David first ruled for seven years over just Judah before the northern tribes accepted him. So that was never a strong alliance, and, and Rehoboam does not realize that, that they could very easily leave. They could do without him, and so they do. And what they do is they make Jeroboam king. And so he establishes the kingdom of Israel, the, or sometimes called the northern kingdom, but it is Israel. And it lasts for about 200 years. The first of their kings is Jeroboam. And one of the first things that Jeroboam does is he notices that the people are still traveling down to Jerusalem for worship. Right? They're going to the Jerusalem temple. That's their central shrine. And he's afraid that if they continue to do that, they will turn back to the Davidic dynasty. They'll see Jerusalem. They'll remember all the good times under David and Solomon. And they will uh, return to, uh, to the Davidides. He doesn't want that. So he builds two alternate places of worship. I mentioned this back in the lesson on Judges. One is at Dan. So again, this, this story in Dan is meant to, to portray that site as having pagan origins. You know, this, this uh, uh, idol uh, so it's portrayed very negatively. Now he establishes this shrine at Dan, and then another one at Bethel. And the significance of those two sites, Dan is at the northernmost point of Israel, and Bethel is at the southernmost point. So this is geographical strategy, right? Those living in the north can go to Dan because it's closer than Jerusalem, and those in the south can go to Bethel because, well, it's on the way to Jerusalem anyway. So it's strategic. And he builds golden bulls there. And this recalls the story from Exodus where uh, Aaron had built the golden bull. In fact, the wording is almost the same. When he builds them, he says the same thing that Aaron said. Behold, your gods who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Same thing Aaron had said. Um... He also builds up high places, okay, so continuing in the practice of Solomon, and he appoints anyone as priests, non-Levitical priests. Uh, so he's not following priestly theology or Deuteronomic theology. So he's evaluated very badly because of that. He's a bad king. Um, and so his dynasty doesn't last very long. He's replaced by another dynasty in the north called the Omrides. The Omri dynasty, founded by Omri. They are, just, they are worse even than Jeroboam. So one of the things we see with the northern king, kings is that they are constantly trying to one-up each other in how bad they can be. So Omri is worse than Jeroboam, and Omri's son, Ahab, is even worse. He sets the standard for wicked kings in the north. But the Omrides actually are very good kings from a certain perspective. Under them, the northern kingdom is actually very powerful and prosperous. This is, I said, that some archaeologists believe that it was actually the Omri dynasty that was the first great Israelite kingdom, not the kingdom of David and Solomon. And it was a powerful kingdom. They built a new capital city in the north called Samaria, and it will remain the capital all the way until the fall of the northern kingdom. And even then, it's so important that the whole area in central Israel is named after it. And there's a whole group of people called the Samaritans because this was the principal city. Um, but, the, but Omri and Ahab are wicked kings. Uh, they worship, in particular, they are not monolatrous. They do not worship Yahweh. They worship Baal. So Ahab, in particular, is infamous for this that he uh, 
establishes shrines and temples to Baal and to Asherah, this uh, Canaanite goddess. Uh, he marries a foreign woman. So again, Deuteronomic prohibition against that. Her name is Jezebel. You may have heard of her before. Uh, she is a Phoenician princess and a uh, fervent worshiper of Baal. And so she and Ahab begin to try to systematically change the religion of Israel from Yahweh worship to Baal worship. Um, and so uh, during the reigns of the Omride kings, there is a prophetic resistance to them. Two prophets named Elijah and Elisha who oppose the, uh, the Omride kings. Elijah is famous for this. Uh, as a miracle worker, but you know he calls down fire from heaven atop Mount Carmel in a, a, a contest with the prophets of Baal and Asherah, where they challenge you to say, let's find out who's really God in Israel. Whichever God can send fire down from heaven and burn up his own sacrifice. And Elijah wins. The uh, Baal and Asherah prophets can't do anything, but Elijah calls fire down from heaven. But then uh, he has to flee out to the wilderness because Jezebel wants to kill him. He's a fugitive prophet. And then he's succeeded by uh, Elisha, who uh, also continues to be sort of a check on the power of the kings. Uh, when we get to the prophets later on, we'll talk about this, that uh, one of the main jobs of the prophets was to hold the kings accountable, to be sort of a uh, control on the other institutional powers, the priesthood, and the, uh, the monarchy. Eventually, uh, again, the northern kingdom uh, is wayward from the start. None of the kings are evaluated positively. They break the covenant. They worship other gods. And ultimately, it leads to exactly what Deuteronomy says will happen. Uh, they are exiled. Uh, the fall of Samaria occurs in 721 BC. And the upper classes, the wealthier people, are deported by the Assyrians. So the Assyrian Empire has arisen by this point. Uh, that's northern Iraq. They conquer Israel and they scatter people. They deport people, um, exile them. And thus ends the northern kingdom of Israel. The southern kingdom, meanwhile, continues on for about another 150 years. They had remained loyal to the Davidic dynasty. Uh, so the house of David continues to rule in Jerusalem and in Judah. Uh, Rehoboam continues to reign over uh, the tribe of Judah. Now he is still a bad king. Still says the Lord did, or that Judah did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They provoked him to jealousy with their sins. They built for themselves high places, pillars, and sacred poles on every high hill and under every leafy tree. And this is during the reign of Rehoboam. So he's not a good king uh, by any by any standard. But some of the southern kings are positive, are good kings. Among these uh, is Hezekiah, who reigns in the 8th century. During the reign of Hezekiah, uh, this is one of the possible periods when Deuteronomy is written, uh, is that there are cultic reforms. They are reforms of the religion. Um, it says of him that he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, just as his ancestor David had done. He removed the high places, broke down the pillars, and cut down the sacred pole. He trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that there was no one like him among all the kings of Judah after him or among those who were before him. So he's a great king from a Deuteronomic theological perspective. In other ways, he was maybe a terrible king. During his reign, um, the Assyrians invade Judah, uh, the king Sennacherib, invades in 701 BC and he conquers everything except for Jerusalem. There are more people exiled by the Assyrians than later are exiled in the actual Babylonian exile. Um, Sennacherib conquers pretty much everything and he has Jerusalem surrounded. And it's at this moment, it's a, there's a story that, that uh, Hezekiah is about to cave in and surrender and the prophet Isaiah encourages him to trust in God, and he does. He prays to Yahweh for salvation, and the response is that God will defend Jerusalem. He says, I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. And that very night, 
It says, The angel of the Lord set out and struck down 185,000 soldiers in the camp of the Assyrians. So a miraculous salvation for Jerusalem. And this is part of the reason that Hezekiah is remembered so positively. On the other hand, he also paid off Sennacherib with gold taken from the temple. So he's a mixed bag in some ways. If you look at him from a perspective of national security and prosperity, the country was nearly destroyed under his reign. Um, you know, it was, uh, it was devastated, and there hardly anything left. Really, just the capital city was all that was left. Um, so in that sense, he was actually a pretty terrible king. But it's not the way that the Deuteronomists are evaluating these kings. They're not interested in that. They're interested in theology and in uh, spiritual practices and cultic centralization and monolatry. All right. Um, then uh, Hezekiah dies and is replaced by his son Manasseh. And it says that he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, for he rebuilt the high places that his father Hezekiah had destroyed. So all of Hezekiah's reforms are undone by Hezekiah, or by, by Manasseh. He erected altars for Baal, made a sacred pole as King Ahab of Israel had done, worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. So he begins to behave a lot like the Omrides, like Ahab had done, worships other gods. He is said to have practiced child sacrifice and necromancy, communication with the dead, and sorcery. He even sets up idols to other gods inside the Jerusalem temple itself. He is the worst king that Judah ever had. He he's even kills people. It says he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood. There is nothing positive about him. And it is with Manasseh that judgment is decreed. So in 2 Kings 21, because of the sins of Manasseh, God declares that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed and the exile is going to come. So he says... Um, because King Manasseh of Judah has committed these abominations and has done more, th done things more wicked than all who were before him and has caused Judah to sin with his idols, therefore, the Lord said, the God of Israel says, I am bringing upon Jerusalem and Judah such evil that the tears of, ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. I will stretch over Jerusalem the measuring line for Samaria and the plummet for the house of Ahab. What that means is it's going to meet the same fate as the northern kingdom. I will wipe Jerusalem as one wipes a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. And this is because of, really because of Manasseh. So Manasseh is the tipping point here. Exile is decreed. But then Manasseh is succeeded. Well, first he's succeeded by his son Ammon, but he does not reign very long. Um, he only reigns for two years. He is then succeeded by Josiah. And Josiah is much more like his great-grandfather, Hezekiah. He is a reforming king. Um, and it's during the reign of Josiah we have this interesting story about a book that is discovered. That these priests are working in the temple and they discover a lost book. And it's a book of the law. And when they present it to the king and he reads of the things that they have not been obeying, and he reads about the curses that will come upon them. Again, this seems to be Deuteronomy, that uh, he enacts a number of reforms. It says, Josiah put away the mediums, wizards, teraphim, which are a type of idol, the idols and all the abominations that were seen in the land of Judah and Jerusalem, so that he established the words of the law that were written in the book that the priest Hilkiah had found in the house of the Lord. So they're saying he's doing what this book requires and the things that he does sound like the things that Deuteronomy says to do. In fact, he is so great that it says that before him there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart and all his soul and with all his mind according to the law of Moses, nor did any like him arise after him. So he's the greatest of the kings. And so his reforms, because they seem to be so rooted in the book of Deuteronomy, are called the Deuteronomic reforms, the things that Josiah does includes centralizing worship, he gets rid of the high places, um, he gets rid of all the idols and the altars to foreign gods that Manasseh and others had built. He gets rid of the illegitimate priests that had been serving. 
Um, he destroys the shrine at Bethel. So he even goes into the old northern kingdom, and that shrine is still there, and he destroys it. He ends the practice of child sacrifice that Manasseh had engaged in. So he's a great reforming king. Unfortunately, he dies. Shocker, I know, yeah, that he would eventually die. He dies, uh, he's killed by uh, uh, the king of Egypt, and his reforms die with him. Uh, the Josianic reforms, the Deuteronomic reforms, failed. It says that still the Lord did not turn from the fierceness of his great wrath by which he was kindled against Judah because of all the provocations which Manasseh had provoked him. So again, it's blaming Manasseh. It's because of Manasseh, not Josiah. But even Josiah could not avert the destruction that was coming. The reform dies with Josiah at Megiddo. And uh, Josiah's successors return to the practices of Manasseh. They do not follow in his footsteps. So he's, he's succeeded by Jehoiakim, uh, who is wicked uh, and returns to the practices of Manasseh. He dies and is replaced by Jehoiakim, who only is able to reign for a few months before the Babylonians show up. So King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, which is the new empire that is replacing Assyria, shows up in Jerusalem in 597 BC and captures Jehoiakim and his nobles and carries them away into exile into Babylon. Does not kill them, but takes them to Babylon. He places uh, Jehoiakim's uh, uncle, Zedekiah, on the throne. And uh, Zedekiah uh, is king for about 10 years. Uh, but he rebels against the Babylonians. He's also a wicked king. And so they come back in the year 586, and they destroy the temple and Jerusalem, and they deport more people. They, and uh, this is the end of the Davidic monarchy. This is the end of, uh, this is, the, this is the, what we call the Babylonian exile. It is the end of the Davidic kingdom. It's the end of Jewish independent rule for uh, most of history. Uh, there are a few other periods where it did happen, but... Um, this is a major turning point, a uh, major, major transition in Jewish history, uh, where they go from being a nation with a king to now being a group of people who, who uh, live as a minority, an ethnic and religious minority in a world that has certainly gotten, suddenly gotten much larger uh, under these empires. And that will continue beyond the exile into what we call the Second Temple Period or the post-exilic period. Um, so there's, that's kind of a bird's eye view. I know mean, we covered a lot there, but did it, uh, you're really just hitting the high points because this is a lot of material, uh, in, uh, Samuel and Kings, um, and, uh, so many Kings to, to keep track of, but I've tried to pick out those that are most important here, uh, with the, uh, uh the fall of the North and the fall of the South. So that you can see that that's what this is all leading to. The Deuteronomistic history is ultimately leading toward uh, the end of the monarchy and the exile. So that what we'll be looking at af from this point on is mostly reflections on that event. Um, especially the, the uh, next week with the, the works of the Chronicler. Those are going to go back and retell the story of Israel's history from the perspective of being on the other side of the exile. And so there are some important differences there. So uh, we, will, we will take a look at that. Uh, and that will be after uh, you take the exam. Um, so the, the midterm exam is uh, here in week four. Week five, we will move on to the post-exilic period.